I want to take a look back at 2016 and some of the events that occurred that are now sort of uh, leading into 2017 and we're even seeing some of the ramifications from those events. So the very first one I want to talk about, number 10, is our Linux Mint backdoor. For those of us who like Linux Mint, fantastic. However, if you were not aware, during 2016 there was a gentleman who goes by the name of Peace. He's a uh, hacker from Europe and he was able to gain access to the Mint project through their web page. Uh, he created a malicious copy of Linux Mint. He uploaded it to the Linux Mint web page. And then he even took the extra step, even though, how many here actually check the hash on stuff that they download? Got a, got a few of you? Oh, that's fantastic. Well, apparently, there's a lot of people who don't. But just in case, he even went in there and made changes to the web page in order to change the hash so that everything lined up. So not only was he able to get a malicious distro up there, he was able to make changes to the web page, get the hash up there, and then to add insult to injury, he then went in there and started making copies of their database uh, multiple times for their web forum, passwords, emails, so on and so forth. Uh, so Linux Mint had a little bit of a black eye from that. The next one I want to talk about, which was very, very interesting because I had, during this time as this was going on, I had a student who was actually from Bangladesh, and he was able to sit down and talk to me about some of the things that were occurring. Uh, the Bangladesh bank heist. Anybody hear about this one? Yep, a few people. This was actually pretty major. Uh, and a individual or group of individuals were able to gain access to the SWIFT code for the bank. Uh, I don't know, think of it kind of like a pin almost. Uh, and using that SWIFT code, they, uh, they were then able to make transactions pretending to be individuals from Bangladesh. However, what was very interesting about this was they initiated their attack, they set up a surveillance system, and then they monitored how it worked. They set on the network in order to make sure that whatever it was that they were doing and the behaviors that they took were very similar in scope and in behavior to a regular uh, daily event. Anybody here know how they failed or where they failed? Spelling. They made a spelling mistake and somebody in New York saw that spelling mistake and canceled their transactions. They were able to steal approximately $80 million. However, if that spelling mistake had not gone through, they would have made off with about a billion dollars. They would have walked off if they had not spelt a single city incorrectly, then they would have gotten about a billion dollars out of that heist. Uh, ramifications from that, there was an investigation that was made. Uh, the, Bangladesh, the Bangladesh bank was using routers that cost approximately $10 a piece. That was, uh, that was a situation that people walked in there and said, well, we'd like to look at your logs. They said, great, here's all of our equipment. Their equipment was designed to not store logs. It was the cheap discount stuff. Uh, everything that they did on their end was designed specifically to make it so if anybody ever got in, they essentially would never know. Uh, in addition to that, uh, individuals who were reporting on this situation, many of them disappeared. Uh, there are rumors, I will put that out there, uh, there are rumors of uh, pretty extensive investigations going on in the background. The money was moved into the Philippines and into uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, if you don't know much about the Philippines, and I know they've been in the news, they're also uh, a very, very big haven for gambling. And so what they were able to do was to take that money, send it off to the Philippines, and then launder it uh, through the, the gambling and casinos and so on and so forth. And so some individuals in the gambling and casino scene uh, began to disappear. Several of them have vanished. So that's interesting. Uh, big coincidence. The next ones I want to talk to is sort of a double whammy. We have LinkedIn and Tumblr, and I know people are thinking, well, didn't LinkedIn get hit before? This is another one. Uh, so 117 million LinkedIn accounts with very, very bad passwords were compromised. And when I say very bad passwords, I'm talking uh, many of those passwords were LinkedIn, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, 
And in addition to that, uh, 65 million Tumblr accounts were also hacked. So that's sort of a uh, theme that we're going to see here in a second. But let's stop in with our friends at the NSA for a second. Uh, shadow brokers were able to gain access to the NSA hacking tools. Uh, they are secret tools that they had designed specifically for being able to get into people's computers, networks, so on and so forth. This group of individuals got in there, gained access to all of it, and began to sell it on the, the dark net. Um, this hack was considered at the time large, as large as or larger than the Edward Snowden leaks. This was such a major situation for all of their tools and toys to end up on the internet uh, that that caused quite a fervor. However, there was no face to put on it, nobody you know, running off to another country, so it really didn't hit the media as much. And then we're going to take one more minute with the NSA to talk about uh, an individual by the name of Harold Martin. And if you're curious about Harold Martin and curious about what he did, he decided to pack 50 terabytes of data up and walk out with it, took it home. Uh, at, at the start of the investigation, it was believed that it was about 500 gigabytes, and they were actually going to kind of let the guy go because his uh, defense was, I picked up all this information and all this data and all these tools, and I took them home because I wanted to practice and learn, and this was for self-betterment, and I'm sort of wayward. And then uh, that turned out to not be the case. He took 50 terabytes. And so that moved it up. Yes? Who was he working for? Who was he working for? Yes, he, he was a contractor. Was he was a contractor. Who, do you know the agency that provided such wonderful talent? I do not. I do not. And, as, and I'm glad that you asked a question, though, because I'd like to kind of interrupt myself here for a moment. Uh, as we go further down, deeper into the list, we're going to start hitting some political stuff. I'm going to be as I'm going to attempt to be as neutral as I possibly can be. Uh, but there is some political stuff in here, and I'm not here to to make any. Um, I don't want anything opinionated. I'm just going to try to give you guys facts, okay? However, Harold did walk away with 50 terabytes, and that moved up to espionage for his charges, which is pretty serious. If you're not familiar with the charge of espionage, that's a pretty big deal. What is the limit before it goes to espionage? You know what? You know what? I, I really do think that the, the situation that happened here, and this goes to an, uh, this is personal opinion just from studying what, what happened here, is they approached him and said, hey, did you take this stuff? And he was coy about it. And then they said, how much data is missing? And he kind of allowed them to think that it was a lot less. And then when they found out that it was over 50 terabytes and that the number was much, much larger than they were led on to believe, uh, I think at that point it, somebody stepped up as a prosecutor and was like, we're going to hit this guy for a lot more. I think that it is a political thing, especially with Edward Snowden, with Julian Assange, with all of the, the previous stuff. This guy picked a really bad time to, to do what he did. I mean, it just was not the political climate for that kind of behavior. Uh, let's talk about Yahoo. Yahoo has been in the news. Uh, and they were in the news back then. 500 million Yahoo accounts were stolen. 500 million accounts. If you're keeping track here, we're rapidly moving towards over a billion accounts lost. And I'm only on number five. Um, Yahoo has a pretty storied history. Uh, a comment that I saw online from a lot of people who were affected by this was, you know, that's terrible that they got my spam account. Somebody got in there, found my Yahoo account, and now they're going to have access to all the spam for all the terrible things that I've signed up for. Uh, I don't recommend Yahoo, and with what's going on with Yahoo, I think a lot of people are starting to move away from them. Uh, number four, adult friend finder. 400 million accounts, we just broke a billion, uh, at the sex site were stolen. And 15 a million of those accounts were deleted. Uh, if you're not familiar with adult friend finder, Adult Friend Finder was a web page that you could go to to try to find people to hook up with. Uh, and you could pay money for them to forget that you use their service. So you would give them X amount of money, and then they would go in there and delete you from their database. That was untrue. 
They were collecting a fee for a service that they rendered and then leaving you in the database. They just flipped the little bit that said active or inactive. Um, Backups are forever. That, yes. Unless you need the data. Then there you go. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> that, that is exactly how it should have been. Uh, that one is very interesting to me. There were also a few other web pages that were hit that were also in that whole um, sex and hookup and so on and so forth sort of realm. Uh, if you'd like some uh, a small precognition here, expect more of those kind of attacks because those are very, very popular and they're easy to make money off of. Uh, individuals who are involved in this attack uh, what ended up happening to them was people would troll through the emails, troll through the accounts, figure out who these people are and where they were. And, and when I say this, they weren't the ones who were using the spammy Yahoo accounts. These were people who were using government email addresses. They were using their church email addresses. These were people who used personally identifiable information in order to get accounts to do super silly things online. And these people were being approached. and money was being exploited from them. Yes? Has anyone done a Splunk graph of success on this, or is it just? You know what, and so one of the things that went along with that is we had, I guess, the rumor mill going that there were individuals who committed suicide because of this attack. There, were, there was more than just a, a loss of money and a loss of accounts. You had individuals who worked at churches who this data dropped, and then the next thing you know, they're killing themselves. So I don't, I don't know how much was really looked into it on, on terms of let's break this down by how much money and so on and so forth was lost. I don't we, care about the money, I just was the site effective. Oh, oh, of how many people got the hookups? Yeah. Oh, no, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> it's, this is the prototypical church scandal, so right. I mean, committing suicide over that is, is Kind of silly. We, well, I mean, we, with the reports that I got, that was the claims that were made. So now we're going to get into the realm of politics here. So number three is going to be John Podesta. And uh, John Podesta, if you are not familiar with him, worked very closely with the Hillary Clinton campaign. And if you were to go type his name into Google, you would find many, many, many emails with him. And if you are familiar with the term Pizzagate, uh, John Podesta's email leaks sort of spawned that um, interest from a large group of people who, who began to investigate uh, things that were in his email. Uh, he was fished. Uh, he received an email through his Gmail account that looked like a reset your email account here document. Uh, and it used a bit.ly link. So if you hovered over the, the, the link where it said reset your email here, it was actually a bit.ly link. Not knowing and not being IT savvy, he took that email and he sent it to a gentleman who worked for him uh, and asked him, is this a legitimate email? The individual who he inquired with replied with, this is a legitimate email. Have him change his password immediately. Now, the claim was made that it was a typo and that it was meant to be this is an illegitimate email make him change his password immediately however because it said legitimate he then went to the bit.ly link clicked on it typed in all of his information into it and then the rest is history they got into the email and immediately began pulling down documents um, there is a investigation ongoing in this situation and in addition to that the individual who told him to click the link uh, has claimed that that was a, a mistake, that that is not his intention, and that that shouldn't have been done. Uh, I guess during this inv investigation, they will make a decision on who is responsible for that situation. Uh, number two is Hillary Clinton. She created an email server, which has been in the news, uh, and that email server was ran by a man by the name of Byron Pagliano. And he created this email server and then used tech support from Reddit in order to run the email, said email server. Yes? This was an exchange server. Yes. That's an important <coughs> Well, and 
So there's something interesting about that with it being an exchange server. Uh, an investigation was started because of the, the, the claims, and this is still an ongoing investigation, uh, claims were made that this system was repeatedly involved in both breach attempts as well as breaches, and that individuals from uh, foreign governments were able to gain access to said email uh, system. A request to perform forensics on the box was made, and uh, the claim was they were unable to discover any information from the server due to the server being too outdated and too old to perform forensics. I don't know about that. I mean, that seems like a... I mean, that was, that was what was stated, so I'm just going to go with it because that's what they, they stated. However, uh, as a person who has worked with people involved in forensics, and as a person who has some modicum of experience with forensics, I would think that maybe maybe they were running a VIC-20. I don't know. I mean, I... <laughs> NT, the small business server NT. Okay. I, I would... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that one. That one's, a, that one's a weird one, and I don't want to get into the politics on it. So finally, the number one one is going to be the DNC hacks, and that's the Democratic National Convention. Uh, in committee. Committee? committee? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Committee. committee. Sorry. Sorry. Convention went off really well. <laughs> so an unknown source, and this has not been, uh, nobody has come forward and WikiLeaks has not stated who their source was, uh, provided emails from the DNC to WikiLeaks. Uh, that collection was nearly 20,000 emails and 8,000 attachments strong. And there is a argument between whether or not it is a Russian operation that provided that data or not. And the individuals who received that data, WikiLeaks, are adamant in their claim that Russia did not provide them that information and that it came from elsewhere. This is also, <coughs> excuse me, also an ongoing investigation. And uh, my understanding is, and this is information that I received up to yesterday, uh, a request was made to be able to investigate and perform forensics on their box and that request was denied. They were told that they would not allow somebody to go into that box to perform an investigation on uh, who may have accessed the box or who may have gotten access to those emails. So I don't know on that situation. Publicly, two companies have had access to it. Oh, really? Yeah. Back in June. Okay. Um, uh, oh, CrowdStrike and another company both posted uh, their response to what their investigations were, and both have turned information over to the FBI. I don't know about if the FBI got direct access. I pre presume you don't. Most people don't really get a chance to tell the FBI no. You would think, right? So um, although we we know at the presidential level, I mean, the Republican Party last time around when Bush was in office threw away 20 million travel wrote, threw away 20 million emails and denied access using presidential privilege, which got thrown out because it was party stuff. So stuff does happen, but yeah. even there, I don't think it, the denial lasted very long. They okay. still they still had lots of time to place magnets in strange places right. to, to, to make things difficult. And again, I don't want to get I don't want to get into to the politics of it, but these are the situations that's that's ongoing right now. Uh, we're going to see a lot more of that over 2017, and this is going to continue. That That is a guarantee you're going to see more of this. Well, you heard it continue today, right? Mm -hmm. Where they hit C-SPAN? Oh, did they hit C-SPAN? The RT got 10 minutes of broadcast on C-SPAN's uh, streaming connection. Yeah, RT is Russia today. It's yeah. Like Russian news or <laughs> funded by the Kremlin, so. <laughs> more importantly, did the ratings go up? <laughs> this, I think the C-SPAN issue is that they do have feeds they take yeah. from RT as a news source, and maybe there was a routing problem internally <laughs> where they put one of their incoming feeds as an outgoing yeah. feed, but... So all their feeds went through Kiev for like an hour. Yeah. So in addition to all of that, um, I don't know how many people here are uh, frequent 4chan. 
But if you've had an opportunity to go by 4chan and look at poll and some of the things that they're discussing, uh, they have also been discussing many of the things that they will be doing over the next couple of months. And uh, I've, I've already seen some of that starting. Uh, they're making a uh, push against ISIS right now. Uh, and I will leave that up to you if you want to investigate that avenue of what they're doing there. But uh, they, over the past two weeks to a month, they were in the planning and processing phase and asking people to participate and looking for people for creating memes and images, writing stories, so on and so forth. And now uh, I was on Reddit this morning and started seeing things that are indicative of their actions and the things that they're doing. So um, it's, it's on the way. And not only is it on the way, it's only growing uh, stronger in terms of the amount of impact that is being made by these actions and the things that people are going after. I think five years ago, we can all agree that for a while, it was just about being funny. What can we do? What can we get away with? What can we get into? What kind of problems can we start? And how can we make people upset so that they get on TV and say something and we can laugh about it? Let's make Oprah say something stupid. That was sort of the, the theme. And today, the theme is how do we go in and make a, uh, a major impact to something going on, like a presidential election? Or how can we make an impact to uh, discussions or our video, our, our uh, television, so on and so forth. So there is some, some major stuff that is happening, some major things that have happened, over a billion dollars almost lost, just only saved because somebody was smart enough to look for a misspelled word. You know, next year somebody's gonna sit down and be like, hey, let's hire a guy for 30 bucks an hour who knows better English. I mean, that's, that's what's gonna end up occurring. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, who knows? They may start uh, doing the, the crowdsourcing. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I guess as long as it's nothing political, does anybody have any questions? Did you see the Assange a a maybe okay? Which one? The Assange. Supposedly, there's. Oh, yeah. With So, for those of you who don't know, there is a. I, I'm going to use the term conspiracy theory. There's a conspiracy theory that Julian Assange was snatched up at some point, and people have been playing videos of heavily edited uh, ways of making it look like a person is in front of a camera or speaking and so on and so forth. So this idea that Julian Assange was interviewed, but that they created that on a green screen, wag the dog style, and have made like uh, a fake narrative of how he's still alive, but really he's hold up somewhere being attacked or something. Or that a more plausible theory is that he's alive, but he has lost control of yes. the WikiLeaks organization and all the private keys. And you'll also see people asking for proof of life or proof of him having access to the keys or please sign something. Uh, when you see a post, you know, somebody will say, hey, this is something Julian Assange says, and down at the bottom will say, please sign. The, what they're talking about is him using his uh, encrypted keys to sign something so that they can prove that he is still in control, which um, I don't really have an opinion either direction on what's going on with that. But uh, apparently, it's important enough to enough people that they're they're very obsessed about it. Well, people still there is still a lot of some people put faith in the WikiLeaks organization and send them data. Correct. <laughs> I would recommend doing your research. Any other questions? Anything else? Yes. So I think it's about a month ago there was a uh, webinar from CompTIA, the certification people. Uh, and they presented like the five top things that non-technical people believe that will keep their data secure, that keep their computer secure, and what security experts the top five things they they felt that you needed to do to keep secure and the only common one was strong passwords number one on the non-experts were like uh, antivirus software which didn't even show up on the experts list the only problem that i have even with using strong passwords is with many of these leaks we're discovering that people are still not securing the passwords that you give them. Uh, so not picking a strong password is a good idea. You should have a strong password, but you should be using a different password at every web page that you go to. If you're not using a password manager, you need to be using a password manager. 
Um, for many of us, 30 characters long minimum, uh, different password on every single web page, and then in addition to that, something that I tell people whenever they ask me, never ever use actual real information for any of your questions. So if they have a security question where it says, what's your favorite dog? Do not be Paris Hilton and put your favorite dog on there and then get on the news and tell people what your favorite dog is because you carry her around because that is how Paris Hilton's account was hacked. She used the name of her dog as her security question for what is your dog's name. Uh, you need to use, I use my, my random password generator to create a random string of characters and place it in there and I have literally had to sit on the phone and spell out a 30, set, 30 character long string of characters to somebody on the under, other end of the phone and they were amazed that I remembered it because I was reading it off the screen. Uh, <laughs> in addition to that, if you are using it, uh, pretty much any modern email provider, uh, Gmail or rolling your own, I have my own email server um, and a few of the people that I know also do as well. Uh, you can actually use your email address followed by a plus symbol and then additional text to identify who the, the, the company is and then use at gmail.com. So you can say dog plus uh, drudge at gmail.com and then you have access, did that for you, uh, then you have access to an email that will be in their system. So if somebody were to go in there and start spamming those emails, you would be able to see whose account was uh, compromised. Uh, you can use that sort of like a canary because they're going to take and they're going to start trying to send messages to those email addresses that you provide and you can set up your box as I do that if something comes in and it is not, if it is to a specific address and it is not from the specific group of emails that I'm expecting, either I send it to spam or I put it somewhere where it is away and I can review it later, but I don't... Um, I don't just willy-nilly click on things because I'm... What's that? Tar Pit. Tar Pit. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, Tar Pit. That would, that would be the, the name for it. Um, so strong passwords, but different passwords. Do not use personal identifiable information in your questions and answers because whatever you place in there uh, is going to show up somewhere else when that place get hit, gets hit. And a lot of us probably don't think about this, but you're reusing that information elsewhere. So your dog or your favorite color or whatever it is that you've chosen, if you're giving them real actual intelligence on who you are, they can use that at a different web page. Um, also, your telephone number, be very cautious with that, especially if you have a cell phone because it's been in the news. Uh, they are going through and contacting your cell phone provider, T-Mobile, uh, Verizon, whoever it is that you have, impersonating you with the data that they have from the databases and getting them to change your SIM card uh, and then running up bills. They are getting access to your home address and other personal information. They are using this stuff to be able to gain access to pretty much your whole life. Uh, does anybody here use two-factor authentication? And you don't have to, to raise your hand if you, if you don't feel comfortable doing so. But many of us use two-factor on our cell phone. They send us a text message, right? And so, what's that? UBKey. Or YubiKey. I like YubiKey. YubiKey is a, a nice one since it's hardware-based. Uh, you can get the GitHub brand one for like 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. It's accessible. Oh, that's cool. But with your cell phone, you're supposed to get that six-digit code or eight-digit code or so on and so forth. Uh, they are calling up T-Mobile, and they are identifying themselves as you. They are getting them to send your SIM card information to a SIM card that they have specifically prepared for access to that. And then they are getting your code sent to that phone and then using it to get into the accounts. Yes? Um, it, you may not know this, but you can lock your SIM card with a password or PIN code so that um, one of the things that thieves would do is they would steal the phone, they would pull the SIM card out of it and run that like it was a stolen uh, credit card. And uh, you can put a pin on that so that it can't be used elsewhere 
Um, I don't know if this works with the account that you're talking about, but I think it locks the account as well. Some. And, and again, that's the problem because um, if, you, if you go to some of the security forms right now, somebody recorded themselves essentially getting a cell phone provider to give total 100% access to the account with no personal identifiable information for the person that they attacked. They, it was just good old fashioned sitting there and chatting it out with the person until they gained access to the account. And you can sit there and listen to them. And they essentially convince this individual on the other end of the line to give them full access to the account. And they don't have to prove who they are, no social security, no driver's license, no nothing. They just talked them into it. Uh, so there is a human factor involved, and once that human factor fails, they, uh, they have access to everything. Uh, it's deprecated out text message and phone verification for two-factor? Yes. Because of it? Yep. And I... I prefer the um, like the hardware stuff, but then even that, like the RSA keys, just a few years ago, the RSA keys got popped, and they were able to gain access to all the RSA keys. So, which is the little the little ones that uh, automatically change, like you have a little tiny screen. I don't know if yes, exactly that one right there, the one that he's carrying. <laughs> Those have already been proven to be a weak link. So. Um, any other questions? Anything else that I'm missing? Yes. Two things. Um, passphrases for things you do. If you do need a memorable password, use passphrases instead. So a sentence has one way more entropy and is easier to remember. Um, and also, have I been pwned? And what? Have I been pwned? Oh, yes. Have I been pwned? So if you have not heard of have I been pwned, uh, you can type it in H A V E I B E E N P W N E D. And they have an API available. Uh, I usually give my students at Mesa access to the, the API with a little script that I wrote. You can put in your email address into the API and yes, and it will spit out whether or not they have record of that email address being involved in a breach. You can sign up for alerts. Yes. If he finds you, this is a security researcher at Microsoft that's just writing it as a thing and he gets alerts, he pulls it, finds paste bins of dumps that people have been selling, things like that. And so if you're subscribed, if he identifies you know, email address or phone number that you've signed up with him, he'll email you and be like, hey, yes. you've been found in a breach. So that way, if the company that was breached didn't notify you, you might still get notified of the breach. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you talk in just a second because I saw you raise your hand. But you mentioned... I have notified companies that they've been breached based on stuff from having been found. And you also mentioned Pastebin. Uh, if you are a researcher and you're interested in this kind of stuff, head on over to Pastebin and start checking out the most popular pastes, and you will start to find within moments uh, as information is leaked onto the web because individuals will go break into a database, they will grab a, a, a collection of emails or other proof of what they have accomplished, head over to Pastebin, post it, and then begin distributing that link over the web to individuals who need to review it because they're doing transactions. Essentially, they're selling that data and selling other stuff, and so they need a way of proving what they actually have, and Pastebin is very popular for that. I also use it for other stuff like transferring scripts and doing stuff work-wise. Pastebin's a great tool, but if you're interested in the, the darker side of being able to see what people are doing with your data, Pastebin's a great place to do that. One thing about having a passphrase, don't choose a sentence that has been published in a book, <laughs> uh, specifically any biblical phrases. These are, what's happening is they're using a uh, dictionary lookup. They're pre-calculating all the hashes, and they're, if they ever get a uh, hash of your password, they have a lookup table of pre-calculated hashes out to something like 20, 24 characters. Um, but uh, they're just basically doing a dictionary lookup, and so they can do a, a, a fairly rapid crack on your password if you use a, uh, you know, something that has been published. Something in, uh, common. Yeah. Don't yeah. use force battery correct staple, but use something <laughs> yeah. like yeah. that. That is a very popular, famous example, but use something that is a series of words yeah. that would not be. But it can be for things you do have to remember, like your last pass password. Yeah. And actually get into your password manager. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, yes, Dennis. So we made a change at uh, Maricopa Community Colleges recently, 
We used to have an online form where you could put in your direct deposit information. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know what happened there. People let go their credentials, and then somebody came in, of course, changed the uh, routing and account information on that form. Now it has to be done at the HR office in person with a paper document. This is why we can't have nice things. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me. For a little bit.